thank you all for coming. I'm not sure if you all came to hear about Utah or if you were just use, uh, coming here for a haven against all of the presidential candidates. But in any case, uh, I'm glad you all made it. What I'm going to speak about uh, this evening is uh, my experience working as a volunteer uh, for the Park Service in Utah uh, and how one would go about becoming a volunteer and then also describe all of my, uh, my activities for the park and so the other places that I visited that were in the area. Um, and I also want to encourage you all, I've spoken to a few of you just uh, in the last few minutes and many of you have already been to uh, Utah, so um, for those of you who have not been to southern Utah, I'm going to encourage you to visit this absolutely spectacular area. So, uh, if someone wants to volunteer for the Park Service, or for that matter, any uh, national and even some state agencies, the website to go to is volunteer.gov. I can mention that the, uh, as far as the Park Service is concerned, there are far more volunteers uh, working for the Park Service than there are paid employees. And in fact, I was told that in the Park Service in general, there are 35 applicants for every one volunteer position. Why they selected me, I'll never know. Uh, once you go to the volunteer.gov uh, home, home page, which is this, uh, you probably can't see it very well. In the, uh, this section here, you have an opportunity to select the state, a keyword, the agency you might be interested in, uh, housing requirements, and uh, you can fill that out and uh, it'll give you all of the opportunities that are in that area. So uh, this, this is an old, an old version, but on that previous page I had selected Utah, and this is showing the, uh, the different opportunities at the time, which is probably about a year ago, that were available. The very first one is Natural Bridges National Monument, which is the park that I worked at. Uh, the next one down is Capitol Reef, and then Bryce Canyon and Canyonlands. Uh, and what I have found and I've been told is that most of the, or a very large percentage of volunteer opportunities are campground host. I was not interested in being a campground host, but uh, as you go through these, you will, uh, if you do, do a search, you'll find that there are a lot of options. It would require having a camper or a trailer and being at a campground and checking people in and cleaning out the toilets, and that's not the way I wanted to uh, do my volunteer time. So here we are in what's referred to as the Four Corners region. The, uh, this is uh, Utah in this section, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Uh, it's called Four Corners. It's the only place in the country where four states all come together at one point, and it's fantastic. You could, you could spend a lifetime in this area and never uh, never see even just a, a fraction of the things that are available. By way of orientation, this is Moab, y Utah is here, Cortez, Colorado is here, Santa Fe, New Mexico, this is the Grand Canyon, and these are the other major parks in Utah. We've got uh, Zion, Bryce, uh, Escalante, Capitol Reef, and so on. This little dot right there is Natural Bridges. And Natural Bridges is, the nearest town is Blanding, which is about a 45 minute drive. And the nearest, and there's not much to do in Blanding. 
And the, the nearest bigger cities would be Moab and Cortez, which were about 120 miles away. It's very, it was very de desolate. So, uh, natural, I, I volunteered at Natural Bridges from October 1st until December 15th of 2013. Natural Bridges was declared a national monument by Teddy Roosevelt in 1908. A couple of other statistics. It's at an elevation of 6,500 feet. And as I mentioned, it's quite, quite, quite remote and isolated. And uh, it's actually, it's off the grid. Uh, they have a very extensive solar array for electricity. They do have some backup generators but it's pretty much off the grid. When I started there in October, there were five, uh, there were a total of five volunteers, and many of them had been there when I first arrived, and then they gradually left, and by the time I left uh, in the middle of December, I was the only volunteer. The, the, the park visitation drops off significantly, especially after Thanksgiving. You know, can can the lights be turned down a little bit more? I would rather people see the <laughs> for the pictures. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Natural Bridges is the first dark sky international park, which means that it's very remote. There's no ambient light. As I mentioned, the nearest town is 45 minutes away. And uh, within the park itself, they directed all of lights were, were directed downward, and there were red lights uh, to minimize any ambient light. And I can tell you, I've never seen the Milky Way as I did while I was there. It's absolutely incredible, the night sky. This happens to be a picture of one of the bridges at Natural Bridges on a night with no moon, with the, uh, the Milky Way in the background. People would come from all over the world to this park and probably to some of the other dark sky parks as well for photography at times when there's uh, uh, no moon out and the stars are so intense. When people would come to the park, when People would come to the park. Uh, the volunteers would give them a, by the way, the, the volunteers did all of the work at the visitor center. The, uh, uh, it was actually run by the volunteers. There were staff there, but they really didn't spend that much time uh, at the visitor center. So when people would come into the park, we would give them a brochure. This is a copy of the part of the brochure. Mile looped paved road. And along the road, there are pullouts where people can uh, park their car, walk uh, 100 feet or so, and look down into the canyon below and see each of the bridges. And there's one, a uh, Sipapu Bridge, a Kachina, and a Wachimo. And in all, unfortunately, the majority of people who come to the park, they say, hey, I've got an hour. What can I do? And in an hour, you can drive a loop road, you can go to the lookout for each of the, the bridges, look down, say, ooh, ah, that's pretty, and then, uh, and then we're off to the next park. But the smart people are the ones who parked the cars, took the trails, took a trail down, so one can start here at uh, the Sipapu, hike down to the Sipapu Bridge, hike along uh, White Canyon to Kachina, go underneath the Kachina Bridge, and then continue on on Armstrong Canyon, get to Owachimo, and this whole area is a mesa, so then when you climb back up to the road, then you can take this road, uh, this trail across the mesa back to where you left your car. The best time uh, to visit would be from May through October, uh, knowing that July and August are very hot in that area.
So, it turns out that my first day of work was October 1st, 2013, the same day that the, the federal government shut down. <laughs> so, I was uh, driving in Colorado on September 30th on my way. I was planning to spend a night in that little town of Blanding and then show up at 9 o'clock on, on October 1st at the park. And I got a phone call from my future supervisor saying, Ron, can you get here this evening because we're shutting down tomorrow. If you come today, you're legit. We can give you your assignment. We can give you your housing. If you come tomorrow, we don't know what's going on. <laughs> so I didn't stop for dinner. I didn't stop for uh, rest. I just kept going and did get there that evening. Um, so the, the, the bad news is that the park was shut down for about 10 days. Uh, the good news is that I got there, I was green, I didn't know the area, and I got together with other volunteers who were already there and just had a chance 10 days to explore the park and many of the areas around the park, which really worked to my advantage because then when the park opened and visitors came, I had enough base knowledge to be able to, uh, to help them. So the, the first bridge uh, on the, that you come to when you're driving on the loop road is called Sipapu. Sipapu is the second largest natural bridge in the world, only after Rainbow Bridge in Lake Powell. Uh, these are two of the volunteers who were there when I got there, and I did a lot of uh, exploring and hiking with these two gentlemen. Uh, Sipapu is a Native American word, I believe it's a Hopi word, that means place of emergence. The Hopis believed that we came, people came to this place on earth through a hole in the ground and that the name of that hole is Sipapu, place of emergence. And the trails going down to each of the, the bridges uh, is anywhere from 250 to 500 feet vertical. Might take anywhere from 15 minutes to half an hour. Uh, and in some places, it, the trail was rather steep and they have uh, ladders to help you go down and climb back up again. The next bridge is called Kachina. And this is in all probability, the, uh, the youngest of the bridges. It's the most massive. You can see the, 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 the thickness of the walls on the side. And it, it also has, the, of the three bridges in the park, it has the smallest opening. And the oldest and the most fragile of the bridges is a Wachimo. And uh, one can, you can tell that this one has been, uh, uh, it's, it's much more likely that this one is going to disintegrate and collapse upon itself before the others. There's, there's not as much rock above it as the other, as the other bridges. So, how were the bridges formed? Whoops. Uh, looking at the, uh, the schematic on the left, it shows a river just meandering across this relatively flat terrain. Uh, this terrain is, is uh, sandstone that had been deposited over uh, millions and millions of years. And, uh, eventual, and there's a, a geologic phenomenon in the Four Corners region called the Colorado Plateau, and it's an uplift where the entire area was, was raised. And as that area got raised, the water had to flow uh, from the higher, the higher uh, mountains and peaks uh, down below, so now the rivers are running with more uh, velocity. And uh, so in this second section, uh, the river is now carved uh, deeper and deeper into the sandstone, 
And then eventually, because of repeated floods and boulders and gravels, and once again, we're not talking about hundreds of years, we're talking about tens of thousands and millions of years, you can see it just uh, through one of the thinner sections, it creates an opening. And that's just from erosion. And then over additional thousands of years, the, with the subsequent floods, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually you have a bridge. Uh, and then at some point, it's going to collapse, and then the river just flows straight through, and the bridge is gone. London Bridge is falling down. So as an example, or uh, the opposite is an arch. Uh, this is a, uh, an arch in Arches National Park. An arch is also formed by water, but it's not at the bottom of a canyon. Generally, an arch is formed, you've got a fin of rock, water starts to percolate through, it creates a little opening in the fin, and then that opening gets larger and larger over time from rain, wind, erosion. Uh, but arches are typically uh, on the top of a, uh, a land mass and bridges are down at the bottoms of canyons. Uh, this is just a shot of, from Sipapu Bridge looking upstream in White Canyon, and that's sort of typical of what you would see. Uh, the, sand, the sandstone is called Cedar Mesa Sandstone, uh, and in some places it's over a thousand feet thick. Where's the bridge in that? Uh, I'm standing, you can't see the bridge, I'm oh, okay. taking it from the bridge. Oh, okay. And here we are at the visitor center. So, um, my mornings were typically spent at the visitor center. Uh, uh, a typical day would start where I would uh, go to the center. My, my residence was just a, a two minute walk in a building behind the visitor center. I'd walk to the visitor center, raise the flag, uh, take the safes, uh, take the, uh, the money drawers out of the safe that were locked up for the night. There were two cash registers two connected to two computers. One was for the bookstore and one was for the entrance fees into the park. Get that all squared away. I w there was a, a little weather station behind the visitor center and I would record how much precipitation and high and low temperatures for the previous 24 hours, record that. Uh, uh, just to the right of the visitor center, every car had to, to come down that road and there was a, uh, a counter embedded under the pavement. I would go and read the counter so we would know how many people visited uh, the park the previous day. Uh, there's a campground, that, a small campground that had uh, 13 places. I would go to the campground, make sure everyone had paid their fees uh, for the night before. And then during the day, my tasks would be to greet visitors, collect entrance fees, uh, sell items from the, the bookstore. It, in the beginning, when I was there, uh, after the park reopened about October 10th, uh, it was very busy. October is a very busy month for all of the national parks in uh, southern Utah. And uh, so it was nice to have two or three volunteers working at the same time. It, it would get very, very hectic. The, uh, af in the afternoons, I was told to rove. And what roving meant, uh, I would ha have my uniform on and just go to one of the bridges, go hike any of the trails, do whatever you want, and just interact with with the people who are visiting, answer their questions, see if uh, they're having a good time. And uh, so that was fun. I, would, you know, I can't say I, I didn't get paid, but if it were a job, what a job to have. <laughs> so here's uh, Ranger Ron at the visitor center. And the way it worked is typically I would work four days four continuous days, and then I would have three days off. Uh, so the th having three days off was fantastic because I got to explore and visit a lot of other areas that were nearby. 
So this is the house that they gave me. It's a three bedroom house. I shared it with one other seasonal park employee. Uh, we each had our own bathroom. It had a kitchen, uh, a living room, dining room, a very elementary crude set of kitchen uh, utensils, but enough, enough for, to prepare some basic meals. And just remember, the nearest town is 40 miles or so. Uh, so if you ran out of milk, you're, you're out of milk. Uh, I would typically go to Blanding once a week for basic things, and the one supermarket there was, uh, oh, I want to be kind. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't want to shop there on a regular basis. Uh, and then about every two or three weeks, I would either go to Moab or Cortez, which had a big supermarket, and I could stock up. And I brought, and I knew this ahead of time, so I brought coolers with me and ice packs. So I would have my station wagon, I would drive and, and get, uh, get my provisions. Uh, this, uh, this is Thanksgiving Day. Uh, this is taken from the kitchen. We were preparing a fancy, uh, Thanksgiving feast. Uh, you can see the dining room is in the back left and the kitchen and the, the living room is in the, uh, the back right corner. It was actually very comfortable and I was told by other, uh, compared to other parks, it, it, this was uh, uh, deluxe accommodations. <laughs> So the uh, park supplied us with, well, there were three or four mountain bikes that we could use. I don't think anybody ever else used them besides myself. Uh, and when I first got there, so this was probably taken the second or third day that uh, I was there. The park was still closed and uh, uh, decided to do this nine mile bike ride. But there are a lot of hills. and. I'd only been there a few days. The elevation is 6,500 feet. Those uphills were rather demanding, and I was out of breath. By the end of my time there, I, I did much better. So uh, I'm going to discuss and show you some of the ruins that are within the monument. There are only two ruins that were on the uh, the brochure that we gave the guests, the visitors, uh, and but there were uh, probably a couple of dozen other ruins that we weren't allowed to tell them. That I eventually I learned about most of them myself and visited, uh, but we weren't allowed to tell the uh, the visitors about them. So the. Uh, the, uh, the first ruin that we could tell folks about was Horse Collar Ruin. If you walk down the trail to Sipapu, the first bridge, and then walked along the canyon bottom towards Kachina, uh, about halfway between the two on the right side, uh, up on a ledge about 20 feet high, under an alcove was Horse Collar Ruin. Uh, and the people who lived here, uh, that are referred to as ancestral Puebloans, probably lived in, in these uh, structures during the warmer months of the year. During the very hot months, they were probably living on top of the mesa in pit houses. And in the winter, during the very coldest months, they went 20 or 30 miles south. And there were other canyons uh, that were lower elevation that they would live in. This is a granary at Horse Collar Ruin. They, uh, they did grow corn and other, uh, other vegetables, and they had to have a way of storing them for long periods of time. So they built these granaries, and this uh, Horse Collar Ruin is called, called Horse Collar because of the shape of the openings in the granary. The other ruin that we could tell visitors about was very close to uh, Kachina Bridge. Uh, it wasn't uh, nearly as elaborate as Horse Collar. It was easier for people to get to. 
And interestingly enough, those red feathery streaks on the wall are natural. And I'm guessing that uh, the ancestral Puebloans built that structure at the base of those streaks uh, intentionally. It was, when I first saw it, I thought that somebody had painted it, but it's actually, it's a natural uh, formation. Uh, so this is another ruin within the park that we would not tell anybody about. Um, you know, the it was okay for one volunteer to tell another volunteer and show them, but uh, obviously the, they're, the park service is trying to minimize the number of visitors because of the inevitable vandalism and people taking things and, and destroying things. And these really are uh, world-class artifacts. Uh, virtually all of the ruins that I visited are, are under an alcove. You can see that it has a natural uh, protection from the elements. Uh, they are anywhere from 10 to 40 or 50 feet above the canyon floor. And the reason for that is twofold. One, it's some protection uh, against invaders. And it's also when they do have the occasional floods, they don't get uh, washed away. And being close to the river, uh, you've got um, trees and bushes and plants that you can use. Uh, and you also have water for, uh, for your crops that you're growing. So uh, right next to uh, Bear Ladder Ruin, there was a wall with all of these handprints, which kind of reminds me of a kindergarten uh, class using finger paints. Uh, but this is a 750 year old rock art or, or possibly kids just having fun. Okay, so I'll, I'll mention that the, uh, the people who lived here, uh, when the Mormon settlers came to this area, uh, they refer to these inhabitants as Moki. Then in the early 1900s, the term that was used was cliff dwellers. Uh, and then in the uh, middle part of the 1900s, the term was Anasazi. Anasazi means, in Hopi, it means enemy ancestor. And the people who lived here were actually the predecessors of the Hopi. So naturally, the Hopi took offense to think that uh, the people who lived here were called um, enemies. So uh, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago, the term that is now used and probably will, will, will stay is ancestral Puebloan people. So uh, this is another ruin within the park called Bigfoot. And it was called Bigfoot because we found a, an impression of a foot at the base of uh, one of the walls. And this one is interesting because of the construction on, on a number of uh, cases. Most of the ruins we found were built of uh, rocks with mortar in between them. The one on the left here, which is a granary, was actually built with, with sticks uh, held together with a plant material, probably fibers from a yucca plant, and then coated with a, uh, a mortar, a mud mortar. And it's th that, this uh, construction technique is called wattle and daub. Uh, and uh, I think this is the only one that I saw while I was there. All of the others were more the more traditional uh, Stone, stone type construction. And this was also uh, an interesting observation. This is also at Bigfoot. Uh, notice how nice the wall on the right side looks. It's got uniform blocks. It has the little pebbles that were probably put in the mortar for decoration. It's uniform. The wall on the left is much cruder. 
not nearly as, uh, as refined in its building techniques. But yet, the wall on the left is over, you can see that it's over the wall on the right, which meant it was built subsequently to the wall on the right. Um, one can only surmise what happened. Uh, people, the people who lived in these uh, structures would come, they would go, perhaps the same family came back, perhaps another family came back. Uh, maybe somebody needed to do a quick addition for their mother-in-law, and so they put up that second wall. So these were pottery shards that I found at the base of the ruin uh, in an area that they call a midden. A midden is basically a trash heap. And uh, archaeologists now carefully go through middens. You learn more about how people live by going through their trash piles than you do by actually going into the structures. Uh, and in some, some of them had uh, uh, chains around the midden and asking people do not walk on the midden. And in some cases, we, we found some where they, the archaeologists probably hadn't completely excavated and examined the middens for evidence. Uh, but it was fascinating to see all these different, different styles of, of pottery uh, at this one location. And the, uh, the folks who lived here were, they were potters, they were basket makers, uh, they were farmers, they were hunters. It's amazing that they could survive in this harsh climate um, and survive successfully. They would, uh, they typically grew corn, squash, and beans, and uh, they lived in this, uh, this area from the year 0 AD to about 1275. Uh, and then they just disappeared. And no one knows for sure why they left, but the consensus seems to be that there was an extended drought in the area, and uh, everybody vacated, and they went uh, south into uh, uh, more southern Arizona and New Mexico. I'd have to think about that. Uh, there, I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, in present day, they have, uh, uh, they've got some small cats, um, I, but I don't know that they would have actually hunted for those. I don't know. Good question. As a comparison, this is a, a, uh, an Inca structure from about the year 1500. And I just show this just as a, a, a um, comparison to a different, different construction techniques, different place in the world, different time frame, uh, still an elementary uh, uh, compared to, to our civilization. Uh, this is in Peru. Uh, another one of the ruins that's within national um, natural bridges it was a ruin called Lightning House, and these are pictographs. The, the handprint is very common. I saw that in so many places. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, and I gave it that name, the one in the uh, upper left. I called it Peapod Sheep because it, I know it's supposed to be a representation of a sheep, but it looked to me like a, a peapod. And these are pictographs. A pictograph is something that's painted on a wall as opposed to a petroglyph where the uh, people actually carved the images in the wall. How, was the, how were the hands done? Okay. It, it appeared to me that people would put their, their hands up and then they used a mortar, a mud, to do an, to do an outline and put mud on the outside because you notice it's darker on the out, outside than it is on the, uh, where the, uh, the hand and the fingers are. So on one of my roves, I uh, was going to hike between uh, Kachina and Owachimo bridges, and one of the other employees at the park said, well, you know, if you're going out that way, 
go look at the petroglyph beneath Big Shoe Rock. And I said, Big Shoe Rock? What are you talking about? He says, just walk along. You, you know, you're going to see a rock that looks like a big shoe. And I said, come on. I'm, you know, I'm, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I'm walking along, and sure enough, I see that. And I think, well, that looks like it could be a shoe. So I got to the base of it and climbed up about 20 feet below from where the, uh, the canyon was. And certainly, I did find a ruin and a series of uh, petroglyphs. Do you tell the tourists about this or not? No. No, would not. And this one was actually uh, hard for me to get to. The first time I went there, I couldn't figure out a way to get up. It was just so steep. And so I went back a, a couple of days later and I found, figured out a way. I did a lot of scrambling and I did a lot of things that if my mother were around, she would be very upset with me for doing. I've read many things, but there doesn't seem to be any, any consensus. What is the stuff that looks down at the bottom of the picture that looks like trash? I think it's just the, the top part of a bush. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, and this was just another ruin uh, uh, within the park called Offensive Wall. Um, and I had to, I saw so many ruins. I, I visited so many places that every once in a while I would have to just, you know, say, run, realize people actually lived in these places 750, 1,000 years ago. And um, these are actually sacred, these are sacred places. So uh, then, uh, the next set of slides are going to be some of the places that I visited outside of Natural Bridges. As I mentioned, I had three days off every week and had a great, op great times to explore. So uh, this is an area called Grand Gulch. Uh, and Natural Bridges is right here in uh, the upper part. And so it would only take about 15 minutes or so to drive from Natural Bridges to this Highway 261, and then 261 just goes south. Uh, it's, it's, think of it as a spine, and then off to the west, all of these canyons, uh, the dirt roads that lead to canyons, and the same thing going off to the right. Uh, th you could, I could spend six months there, and not see everything. It's just an amazing place. It's, it's BLM property. It's not a park. It's not a park service. And uh, because it's not a park, people don't go there all that often. It's much more remote, and uh, it's austere. It's desolate, and it's absolutely incredible. And Compared to you go to, to Zion National Park or Bryce or Escalante and you see thousands and thousands of people. I did many hikes here where I didn't see another, another soul. And also I'm going to mention now because I'm going to refer to it later. This uh, ge geologic feature is called Comb Ridge and I'm going to refer to that. So uh, I was told, uh, this is in the very northern part of this uh, Grand Gulch area. I was told that if I got to uh, a ruin called House on Fire at a certain time in the morning when the sun shone down at a certain angle, the sunlight would bounce off the base rock, reflect onto the roof above the ruin, and because of the texture and the color of the rock, it would give the impression of fire. Well, with the naked eye, uh, I didn't really see it, but I was told, take photos. It'll come out in the photo. <laughs> and there you go. It was just, it's just absolutely amazing. And this, this particular site with uh, 
with a good camera, th there are uh, hundreds of uh, museum quality photos of this site, and I'm sure this has appeared in National Geographic and uh, a lot of other reputable magazines. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible experience to be there. And this only required a, a half a mile, a short half mile walk uh, along one of the canyons. Uh, another one of the ruins that I visited going on the east side of uh, Highway 261 uh, is called Fallen Roof Ruin. Uh, you can see the big chunks of, of rock that are on the, the floor that had fallen off of the ceiling. And this is another one that we, uh, uh, Avery and Joe and I, uh, had heard about. And we drove over this really a uh, crude, unpaved road to where the trail ended, and then we, had heard, we knew the general location of this, and in about an hour or so, we, we actually found it. Uh, we were also told about another ruin called Citadel, and we spent the next two hours looking for that one, but we never did find it. So what's, uh, what's nice is you live in New Hampshire, and if you're a hiker and you like to get outdoors, what do you do? You go climb to the top of a mountain. Well, in the Southwest, you don't climb to the top of a mountain. You look for ruins, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, a different mindset. Uh, so as one goes down Highway 261, just before it ends and, and drops off the side of a cliff, uh, there's a, uh, a viewpoint called Muley Point, and I thought this was an incredible sight. You can see all of the different plateaus, the layers, and millions of years of uh, sediment, uh, sedimentary rock, and down below is the San Juan River, which is a tributary to the Colorado. And this is the road, when you get to the end and you think that uh, you're going to die, it... Uh, it's 11 or 1,200 feet of vertical in the course of three miles or so. It's an extraordinarily steep road with, with switchbacks, uh, with signs that said five miles an hour. And you would be foolish to be going any faster than five miles an hour. Did you see any bicyclists on that road? No. <laughs> no. Uh, this road was built in the 50s for uh, uranium mining. Uh, they had uranium uh, ore trucks that were uh, going up and down this road, and that's the reason that they built it. And then when you're down below and you look at this from a few miles out and you're looking at the face, uh, you say, you can't, there's no way you can get up this. And then as you get closer, you realize that how the road uh, snakes, snakes up this cliff. Uh, that's, yes, I believe it was an inland sea, yes. So, uh, another five or ten miles or so beyond, uh, when, you, when you get down uh, Moki Dugway and you get to this next plateau, you go another five or ten miles south and you get to a state park, and this is called a, a Gooseneck Point, and once again now you're overlooking the San Juan River, uh, a gooseneck just means that the river has essentially turned back on itself. And that is, according to the sign there, what you're looking at is 50 million years of uh, sedimentary deposition. Uh, so I was uh, talking to somebody earlier this evening about slot canyons. And uh, Joe and I, uh, Joe, Joe was a volunteer who was just a few years younger than I, and he, he actually came down from Alaska to volunteer. And uh, so we did this trip together. So about two hours northwest of Natural Bridges, we had heard about a place called Little Wild Horse Canyon. It's a slot canyon, and I love slot canyons. They're just so much fun. You feel like a kid. Uh, in some places, you're walking on a sandy or a gravelly bottom. Sometimes it's rock. Sometimes there are big boulders, and you've got a, the size of a car, you're either crawling underneath it or climbing above it. Uh, 
and uh, the colors and the shapes, uh, the, s the sinuous curves is just enchanting. Uh, so just a, a little close-up of the, the colors and the shapes and the, uh, the rocks there. And here I am in a little wild horse. And uh, uh, you can, in this particular place, it was just a, a gravelly bottom. Then when we came up out of Little Wild Horse, this is the, the, the basin that we, we came to. And um, for anyone who's been in a slot canyon before, the rule is you never go in if it looks like it's gonna rain or even if it's rained recently uh, because you're gonna drown. And so you can just imagine this catch basement for all of the water in this area and it all gets funneled into this narrow little canyon. And when uh, there is a, a rainstorm, it doesn't even have to be a torrential rainstorm, but you've got such a large uh, geographic area funneling all of that water through this canyon that the water in the canyon can rise 10, 20, 30 feet. And there's some canyons that have logs that are you know, th trapped 30 feet above the bottom of the canyon. You do not want to be in a slot canyon uh, during a rainstorm. Is that you standing here? Uh, that's Joe. Yes, in the distance, yes. Yeah, this is my friend Joe. Did you ever feel like you were going to get lost in any of these hikes? I mean, how well marked are these? Quite often I felt that way. <laughs> uh, and in most of the, many of the hikes that I did, especially later in, during my time there, I, I just hiked on my own. Uh, and I was always very apprehensive uh, because I was going to a lot of places that were very remote and I didn't see another, another soul there. And I'm sorry, this is, this is not national This is BLM land. What is BLM? A Bureau of Land Management. Uh, Bureau of Land Management is under the Department of Interior as opposed to f uh, the national parks Geez, let me get this straight. One is under the, uh, no, there's the Park Service. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confused right now. But uh, Bureau of Land Management is, I believe it's under the Department of Interior. And there's a lot of controversy because uh, um, uh, in southern Utah, there are, thousands of square miles of BLM land. And as you, you know, similar to what, what's been in the news lately about in Oregon, these uh, anti-federal uh, protesters uh, don't think that the federal government should own that land. And that same movement is going on in Utah. Uh, the county that I was in, San Juan County, uh, every week in the, in the newspaper, there were articles about the protests and the federal government needs to give the, all of this land back to the county or the state. Uh, but uh, I personally think that would be a major mistake. I, uh, the federal government will protect this land. Who knows, once it becomes in uh, the hands of uh, state and counties, they're gonna open it up for drilling and all sorts of uh, development. Uh, on Combe Ridge, that ridge that uh, was on the east side of the Grand Gulch area, uh, went up there on a hike and we had heard about this uh, uh, petroglyph called Procession Panel and there were about 200 individual images that were, were pecked into this rock. Uh, one of the other places, uh, monuments that I visited is Hovenweep, and it's just, uh, it was east of Natural Bridges. It's right on the border between Utah and Colorado. And unlike the other places that I visited, 
that had smaller ruins, or you'll see in the next couple of slides, uh, Mesa Verde, which is substantial. This is, these appear to be um, forts or lookout or watchtowers, uh, and I never did understand exactly why they were built, but there were a number of them all along the edge, the rim of this one canyon. There must have been five or six that were, that were like that. And probably the granddaddy of all of the so-called cliff dwellings is Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde National Park. Uh, some of the ruins that I showed were, were just, you know, a family or two, perhaps five or ten people were living in them. And this was a, uh, you know, this is New York City for, uh, for the ancestral Puebloan people. Um, and probably hundreds of people lived in, uh, in this location. This is one that you cannot go on your own. You do have to go with a, uh, a park service a guide. Is that Utah still? The, uh, Mesa Verde is Colorado. It's the southwest corner of Colorado. And this is another uh, structure at Mesa Verde. It's called Spruce Tree House. And notice the in the forefront that circular area with the two sticks going into the hole. Uh, that is called a kiva, and we're going to talk about kivas in a, in a few minutes, uh, but that's actually a ladder going into this kiva, which is an underground ceremonial chamber. Almost all of the ruins, even the, the small ones that I visited, had a structure, a dwelling where people lived, it had a granary, and it had a kiva. Um, so when I was at Mesa Verde, I was talking to a woman who was in a, uh, the visitor center, and I was admiring the pottery that they had on display from many of the Indian tribes that were in the area. And I really liked this one, uh, the pottery by the, the, the style of the Hopi. And she said, well, you know, you can go down to the Hopi reservation, and you can take a tour, and uh, you might find that interesting. So on uh, one of my, my weekends off, I did go down to the Hopi Reservation. They will not allow you to take photos anywhere on the reservation other than right here, which was just the, the motel where I stayed at. I hired a, uh, a local Hopi guy to show me around, and we spent five hours. He drove me around in his pickup truck, and he told me about the history of the Hopis, the, the current situation, uh, uh, the, a little bit about traditions and religions and cultures and beliefs, and the history and battles between the Navajos. It was absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then he said, uh, it just so happens that tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning, there is going to be a ceremony on one of the mesas. There are, in, in this Hopi reservation, there are 13 villages on three different mesas. And he said, on Mesa 3, there's going to be a ceremony tomorrow. And it has something to do with welcoming young girls uh, into the tribe. And he said, most of the time, ceremonies are not open to outsiders, but this one is. And you might find it interesting. <laughs> he said, but. Be careful. Don't talk to anybody. Don't ask any questions. And there's going to be, uh, at some point, they're going to be throwing objects into the air. And just be careful that you don't get knocked down. <laughs> so I was a little nervous about that, but I went. And when I got there uh, the following morning, uh, I went to this village. And the central courtyard was about the size of a basketball court. And um, there were about 500 people uh, around the perimeter of this courtyard. There are also adobe buildings with flat roofs, and people were sitting and standing on tops of the buildings. So there were uh, altogether, I'm guessing, about 500 people. I was the only non-native person there. So this was a ceremony that was meant for them. This was not a tourist attraction. This was not Disneyland. This was the real thing. And so after a few minutes, uh, a group of elderly uh, Hopi uh, women came in wearing these beautiful robes with reds and cream colored and black, uh, walking slowly, chanting, and carrying uh, some sort of a basket. Uh, they worked their way into the courtyard, formed a large circle, continued to chant, 
And then uh, a few minutes later, young girls, probably 13 to 15, uh, wearing a different type of attire, but also very colorful, came into the circle and had these big bags of trinkets and would just throw them into the, into the crowd. And that's where this, all of this jostling came in. Everybody's trying to, to grab something. Most of it were just cheap trinkets. I, I wound up catching a, a box of Cracker Jacks. <laughs> and I have no idea what the... I have a general sense of what this whole ceremony was about, uh, but because I couldn't really ask, um, um, I guess I'll, I'll never know. <clears throat> on my way back, on my way drive, my drive back from Hopi land back to Natural Bridges, I was in the Navajo Reservation, and I just, I, I, I fall in love with the colors and uh, the, the, uh, the sharp contrast between the blue skies and uh, the red rocks. So on one of my other hikes in the Grand Gulch, uh, I had heard about a place called Perfect Kiva. And uh, this was a, probably uh, the, the scariest I was on my hike there because it was a very rugged hike. And I wound up having to climb, you see, on the opposite side, that cliff. I had to <laughs> follow a cairn trail going down that. And even though I got down, once I got to the bottom, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get up at the end of my, at the end of the day. Obviously, I'm here, so I did. <laughs> but uh, I'm hiking down the canyon. I knew about where this was, and then I saw a footpath going off to the right, so I climbed up here. This was probably only two or three hundred feet above the, the canyon floor. And I found this slick horn, uh, this perfect kiva. So this is not a restored kiva. This is the way it was. It's, you know, once again, it's under an alcove, it's protected, and um, I could see that people had been down that ladder before, but I wasn't going to go down there. Uh, there wasn't another person around for miles and miles, and if a rung on the ladder broke or something happened, <laughs> I'd, I'd still be at the bottom of this kiva. Only, only little critters, you know, squirrels and chipmunks. I did not, Joe, the fellow that I, I did a lot of traveling with, the other volunteer, he did see a little, uh, a midget rattlesnake. Um, but, oh, oh, well, there were deer. Uh, and I guess now that you mention it, uh, on, on my drive back and forth from uh, Natural Bridges to Blanding, I did see a lot of deer and a lot of jackrabbits. So that's obviously what they were, what they would have been hunting. Uh, I would guess um, 10 to 15 feet deep. So these uh, kivas were used as uh, ceremonial chambers. Uh, they would uh, chant, have ceremonies, do arts and crafts, play music, smoke their peace pipes. Uh, and uh, it was a general, general purpose. So every, Every ruin that I found had a, a kiva of some sort, as well as the granary and the, the dwelling structure. Is this naturally occurring, or was this something that was built? This was built. So it's up. No, this, uh, this is in an alcove. It must have been soft uh, dirt. It, was, it wasn't solid rock, and they must have somehow excavated that. <coughs> I don't know what kiva means. How would you define what a kiva is? That one? Uh, it's uh, primarily a ceremonial chamber. Is it a, a daily or a weekly? Is it a we d we don't we don't know. Uh, this is uh, another hike that I took in the Grand Gulch to a place called Junction Ruin, and this is. A kiva that's not in very good shape. The roof is gone, but you can see the pillars and uh, where the wood supports would have gone across diagonally in many locations, and then they would uh, continue to add more logs uh, consecutively and, and build up the uh, 
um, the, the roof that way and then ultimately uh, rocks and mortar and that was your that was the roof on the Kiva now this is a this is back to Mesa Verde this is a <coughs> this is a restored Kiva and you can see how nicely uh, it would have it would have looked at the time that it was actually built uh, and you'll notice there's some holes on the right hand side uh, that was ventilation that pit in the middle was for a fire and you know my, my guess is in the colder times they probably stayed in there to to be warm and there must have been some other ventilation uh, to the left that's out of the photo because there's a baffle there and that baffle was to prevent the uh, the wind from blowing out the fire and also in all of the kivas it would have had a small hole in one in one section that was the sipapu which is this place of emergence and uh, back to uh, the perfect kiva at Slickhorn uh, this uh, is exactly the way that I found it I don't know whether it's been uh, disturbed or not but the two rocks on the sides that are a little reddish in color that are concave are, are called matates and they are used for grinding corn and that a granite looking rock with an indentation that's on the left matate is called a mano and that's what was used to to grind the corn so the corn was between the mano and the matate and you can actually see a couple of corn cobs that are still there. There's a corn cob here and it looks like that one as well. So whenever you travel in the southwest you'll see this uh, in the desert country you'll see biological soil crust that's also called cryptogamic soil. It takes decades if not longer to uh, to grow but it's the first thing that uh, grows uh, in this in this arid in this arid climate and it's a combination of bacteria and mosses and fungi and algae and bacteria and you'll see signs do not walk on the biological soil crust because when you step on that it can destroy it and it can take decades for it to to grow back the typical tree life uh, were pinion and juniper and they are referred to there as the PJ forest And uh, the day after Thanksgiving, I still had a few days off, so I drove to Moab and then uh, spent one day in Canyonlands and one day in Arches. And to be in Canyonlands in a, in a desert climate with snow on the ground, the red dirt, uh, the red rocks, unfortunately the sky was not blue that day, but it's, uh, it's an incredible, incredible place. Uh, this is just another another scene in the Devil's Kitchen. This is the Needles District of Canyonlands. Canyonlands has three districts. Uh, and on this particular day, uh, the first part of my hike was about 12 miles that I hiked that day. The first six miles, I was just by myself. And then uh, in this park area, uh, I met a, uh, uh, a fellow and his son. His son was about 18 years old, and we chatted, and we continued to walk. and hike out the rest of the way are uh, together. And it turns out that he is the chief organist for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And there probably aren't any more uh, prestigious uh, organ, organ jobs than that. I met some fascinating people while I was out there. Uh, one often doesn't think of uh, cactus and snow in the same sentence, but there you go. And then uh, this is Arches National Park. This is Landscape Arch. It's probably their most famous arch. It's about 300 feet across. You can see that it's uh, fragile. And I know about 20 years or so ago, a big chunk of rock came falling down and some people were sitting underneath it having lunch and I just missed them. So since then, they do not let anybody go underneath the arch. And uh, just uh, another arch in arches, partition arch. Yeah. 
and double O arch. All of these places have such great names. And this is the Devil's Garden. In Canyonlands, they've got the Devil's Kitchen, and in, Ar and in Arches, they've got the Devil's Garden. Uh, once again, just beautiful, uh, beautiful terrain. If, if this is what you're into, uh, uh, and I am, it's just exquisite. How cold was it there? Uh, it was in the, uh, probably the 30s. Uh, and towards the very end of my, my stay, I think the last few days that I was there, I had heard about a place called Ballroom Cave. And uh, uh, I got to the trailhead, and I didn't know exactly where it was, but I knew it was up this uh, particular uh, wash uh, stream area. And uh, once again, you know, you know, blue sky, white snow, red rocks, it's, I love it. And after a, uh, an hour or so, I'm looking for a cave, ballroom cave. I didn't know what to look for, and I saw some, a ladder uh, up there, and I thought, hmm, there must be some reason for the ladder. So I went there, and I climbed up the ladder, and sure enough, that took me to the entrance to this very large uh, cave area. And at the entrance, uh, right inside the cave is, uh, was a ruin. Uh, not in the best of shape, and then further back the cave, uh, well, I can show you right here. This is the, uh, from inside the cave, looking out, uh, and at the very, very back uh, of the cave, as the, as the opening got smaller and smaller, supposedly there were a couple of other rooms with ruins. Oh, once again, I was by myself, and I decided I didn't want to put myself in jeopardy. I didn't go all the way back in. And then close to uh, Ballroom Cave, I found Target Ruin. And these are pictographs. And this is the only place that I saw pictographs with, with different colors like that. They obviously use different pigmentation to make these images. And I mentioned that uh, the Comb Ridge on to the east of the Grand Gulch this is, uh, it's called a monocline. It's 120 miles long going north to south. North is on the left. Uh, you can see that cut out in the, uh, in the formation. That's where this road went through the rocks. So we're looking at the western side. And on the west, it was just uh, uh, almost a sheer vertical cliff. And on the, on the eastern side, on the side that we can't see, it's a more gradual, uh, uh, slope going down. It obviously raised up, but I don't, I don't know exactly uh, the, the geological uh, history of it. So we are now uh, back to the beginning. If you remembered, you all want to apply to be a volunteer for the Park Service. So the way to do it is go to volunteer.gov and if you do uh, and you, you work for the Park Service for three months or so, they're going to give you a hat. <laughs> so I, I've got it in the back. I, I forgot to bring it up. For, oh, there it is. Here's my, here's my National Park Service volunteer hat. They let me keep it. <laughs> and if that's it, thank you all for uh, coming tonight.